The very first thing that money said to me was, I would like to tell you to love me. There was just an exercise in it that said, what would money like to say to you? And I was journaling, so I just started writing and my pen literally started writing for itself. It was completely automatic and it said, I'm an energy, I'm very powerful and beautiful. And it talked about how you can do anything with money. It was like giving permission, you can pay for things with me, you can invest me, you can have fun with me, you can spend me, you can receive me. It's like, take me, I'm here, I'm yours. It was like very generous, beautiful and totally unexpected expected message and it ended with the words what's going on everybody welcome to the tribe of millionaires podcast i'm your host jamie gruber and my job is to dissect peak performance through conversations with the most accomplished people on the planet with the goal of making this tribe that i'm creating here your tribe my guest today sarah mccrum started her work with money in 2010 when she spontaneously wrote a letter from money to herself she wrote the bestseller, Love Money, Money Loves You, in order to teach the laws and energy associated with money. She's a business owner, author, coach, and teacher, and I'm truly blessed to have you on today. Sarah, welcome. Thank you very much, Jamie. I'm really delighted to be here. Yeah, no, I love having you. So shout out to Jason Dries. Uh, I mentioned his name to you a moment ago. He's a, a performance coach that I've worked with that recommended this book. So Jason, if you're listening, thank you. Um, I want to start with you know this idea of the the practical or logical versus say the spiritual. So when I heard the title of your book, and then as I started to read it, I almost felt like, okay, I have to suspend logic and suspend rational, the rational part of my brain, and sort of go down to a spiritual base in order to get this. So it feels very uncomfortable. But I think what you teach, and I think what your brand, what you bring to this, this, this energy of money equation is actually to affirm no, you need rationale, you need logic. And that's the basis of any relationship that you're gonna be in. But we all understand, I think, that there's an upper limit to rationale, there's an upper limit to logic. And at some point you need to ascend into the spiritual or even into a place of love. That's the relationship I think you are talking about with money. How's my aim on that? I would say that that's actually pretty good. Uh, my experience has shown me and also frameworks that I've actually studied that absolutely, as you say, you need that base of rationality. And I would say that that's a really good principle. I was taught once that if you could make your lower limit rationality rather than reactivity, victim, or you know all the other places we can go to, then you're doing really well. But I've worked with many people, and actually, interestingly, many men who are pushing the limit of the rationality. They're very good business people. They're extraordinarily capable. And there's this, it's kind of like there's something missing, or there's some kind of longing, or they're looking, it's like they're looking for themselves. And they're so good at doing everything they do, but they always feel that they haven't really found that piece. And that's where we kind of push the upper limit of rationality and we start to actually really go into love or what we could call emotional, um, like emotional power. And I think, I mean, for me, spirituality in a way is going beyond that. I don't think we even need to talk about spirituality at this level. I think what we really need to talk about is what difference does it make when you bring love into the equation, when you bring love into business, it's like a very uncomfortable topic often, but it's a game changer in terms of results that satisfy the rational mind. It's a game changer in terms of relationships. It's a game changer in terms of purpose and alignment and fulfillment. And these are the things that we, many of us do business for. And actually another thing I think is really important, it opens up the door to joy. So many people I meet in business really want to experience freedom and joy. And they get a bit of enjoyment here and there. Mostly they work really hard. Or sometimes they get, you know, some enjoyment on the side, let's say, but real joy in business. That's the thing that really changed for me by, um, by writing these messages for money, essentially, which turned into the book and actually learning how to apply it in my own life. You had a business failure in 2011, I believe, which sort of prompted this exploration about your relationship with money. Um, can you give us just context for those who haven't read the book yet? What is this letter that I talked about in the intro and that you just mentioned? What is that about? Where did that come from and what did it do for you? And, and full disclosure, I wrote a letter. I think I shared it with you, uh, inspired by your book. And maybe we'll read it later. We'll see. But it was, it was very, very liberating 
And I'm just curious where that came from and if you could sort of ground this conversation in that, in that practice. Well, I had very, very recently had a business failure, which anyone who's experienced that will know that it's a deeply humiliating and painful experience of not being able to pay your bills and letting clients down and letting suppliers down and all of that stuff. And it was horrible. And I think just a few weeks afterwards, I had nothing to do. I'd been used to working seven days a week, pretty much. You know, I was doing the typical business owner, director kind of thing. And I was sitting on my bed, we weren't able to pay for the flat that we were living in in London. It was, you know, a really, really difficult situation. And I was reading a little book that was called How to Become a Money Magnet. And there was just an exercise in it that said, what would money like to say to you? And I was journaling, so I just started writing. And my pen literally started writing for itself completely. I was, it was completely automatic. I was watching these words come out of the end of it, all handwritten. I wrote about two pages. And the very first thing that money said to me was, I would like to tell you to love me. And then it went on and it said, I'm an energy, I'm very powerful and beautiful. And it talked about how you can do anything with money. It was like giving permission, you can pay for things with me, you can invest me, you can have fun with me, you can spend me, you can like, receive me. It's like, take me, I'm here, I'm yours. It was like very generous, beautiful and totally unexpected message and it ended with the words don't wait just take me i will love you and so that money speaking to me saying i would like to tell you to love me and i will love you that's really the the source of the name of the book because i wrote messages every day after that for a few months and that's what became the book love money money loves you and it is just the pure raw unedited messages that came out of my pen without a single mistake in the whole book, which is quite extraordinary because I don't write like that normally. So it was just a very, very unusual experience that anyone can argue with me about it. Is it real or not? But I can't deny it because it happened to me. And it was so, it was so beautiful. And it opens up a possibility for us to have a relationship with money that is aligned with our deepest values and therefore to make business and make money in a way that actually feels good and is fulfilling. The, the rational brain wants to ask, okay, is this just, if I sit down and write that letter, is like something's gonna happen? Is that what you're saying? Or do you need to be in a certain state? Like how would you recommend somebody leveraging that exercise? Well, actually it's really common these days to teach automatic writing. It's not a million miles away from that, but automatic writing, you, you never quite know where it's coming from. So that just for anyone who doesn't know, that's when you just sit down and you just kind of let your, you just let your pen write, just whatever comes out and you let it flow. And sometimes there's a whole lot of garbage that will come out to begin with, but most people usually find that there's some coherence that emerges from it. But I think the tricky thing about that is you don't really know what you're tapping into. It's a kind of intuitive, um, intuitive method, if you like. And intuition tends to be a very, very strong skill in entrepreneurial people. So um, I think it's part of our natural territory. But this is just different because it's not so much that you need to imagine, but it's really just if you say, okay, I want to see what money wants to say to me, and I'm going to let myself be free, and I'm going to let whatever comes out come out. I'm not going to try to control it. I'm not going to make sure it says the right thing. I'm not going to be linear about it, and I'm actually not going to be rational about this particular thing because it's a very irrational experience. But that doesn't make it an inferior experience. It Actually, what you find is it makes it an elevating, expanding experience, and it makes you feel more whole, more yourself, more like a, a, a fully alive human being, which is, I think, what we really long for when we're here. So it's something to give a go. And if you sit there and look at a blank piece of paper, that doesn't matter. You're just looking at a blank piece of paper. And if you find, like many people find, it's so many people have done this, that something really surprising and beautiful comes out in front of your eyes, like, take a moment and ask yourself, what's happening here? And what's the value of this message I'm receiving? And does it resonate with me? Does it feel somehow more right than the way that I'm used to relating to money? When I did this exercise, I was in a space where, yeah, you know, things turn in the economy, 
it felt like spigots were turning off uh, here and there, right? In in my businesses that I that I have, and it and it's funny because it's not as if there's a lack of money. We're doing well, but I fear what you went through. I think at one point in time where it's like, okay, we can live off of this if more doesn't come in, but at a certain point, all of that runs out. And so I, I was finding myself avoiding it, not looking at the accounts, not wanting to like, I'll pay the bills at the end of the month. I don't even want to look and see what's in there right now. And when I wrote this letter, and to your point, it, it did it did sort of start in a ramble and then got more clear. And I think I even at the beginning of it had to write for myself, like, how do I tune into this frequency? Like, okay, a Benjamin Franklin is going to write me. Like, how do I, <laughs> that's what my brain was saying. Like, how do I actually tune into that? So I went through like a cadence and we can get into that later. And then by the end of it, and since then, to be honest with you, it's felt it's felt very light. I've I've detached a bit emotionally from from uh, uh, the 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 negatives I associated with money, and it's just it's an energy, it's a feeling, and things have improved. The key to life it isn't money, it's happiness. And when you measure how happy you are, you actually become even more happy. Our friends at GoBundance, the tribe of millionaires, use a very specific tool to measure their happiness. It's called the Life Happiness Index, and you can have it too. Go over to GoBundance.com slash LHI and take your Life Happiness Index assessment. You'll rate yourself in multiple categories on exactly how happy you are and get a custom output for you specifically that you can use in developing whatever goals you have for your life. GoBundance is the tribe of healthy, wealthy, generous people who choose to live epic lives. And the tool GoBundance members use at the base of all of that is the Life Happiness Index. Get out there and grab life big. For you, after you went through this exercise, what have you seen? Like, what has been the change in your life? What have you, what have you had come up in your life in, in the 10 or 12 years since this exercise? Oh, that's a big question in a way. Um, but I will... Um... I'll, I'll, I'll find the highlights of it. The first thing I think, the, the first couple of years, this might be surprising um, in a way, I sort of tried to ignore the book. I'd been told at some point by a teacher that if you if you don't follow those kinds of messages properly, awful things can happen to you. And so I was really scared because I knew that I was not going to be a very good student of my own book because it was so different. I grew up incredibly middle class, British, very uptight, um, no, no real inner freedom at all. And this book is, is so liberating, like you said. So I knew I wasn't going to be a good student of it. So I just avoided it. That was my first stage. The second stage was I moved um, to Australia with my partner. And we had, within a few weeks, I had to pay all the bills. We had no money left. We had just enough you know, to get there, get a really cheap car and rent a house. And that was it. And somebody said to me, you need to use your book. And that was when the book came out and I started literally, it was like, how do I pay the rent this week? I can't see any clients. I didn't know a single person in Australia. So I was starting a business from zero, trying to coach people. And I used it. And the interesting thing is that time and time again, in these simple kind of rather beautiful and synchronistic ways, it worked. And when I, you know, somebody, I would be expecting a client who's going to pay $200, which I was totally reliant on to pay the rent. And then they would drop out in the morning because something would happen. And instead of panicking, I just like, I just, okay, what's in my book? It's okay. It's an energy. It's here. It's present. Da, 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 da. And another $200 would come in unexpectedly. Like we all hear these stories, but it really happened. And it happened when I needed it. And that was my training ground. My training ground was really living on the edge where I could never rely on having more than maybe $20. I had more at times, but I, it, I it easily dropped down to having virtually no money at all. And so it was very, very good training, um, quite tough, but we did it. And then um, the stage that happened after that, I, it was really clear. I remember still this day, we were, we were traveling. We were in the States. We were traveling on a shoestring, literally. Um, we'd hired a car and we would drove about 4,000 miles around all these national parks. And there was wow. a day when I suddenly realized I didn't have enough money to pay for the accommodation that night. And I had to go to the people we were staying with and say, look, I'm really sorry. I've messed this up. And um, in fact, the money came in by the next morning and it was all fine. Um, but the interesting thing was very shortly after that, I reached a point where I knew 
this sounds such a silly story, but I knew that we would always have $200 available. My bottom, my floor went up from 20 to 200. And then it, it always went in these twos. It then went up to around 2000. I remember thinking, I'm never going to worry about rent again. I'm never going to worry about, you know, those kinds of things. I'm always going to have at least a couple of thousand dollars available. And then it went up to about 20,000, obviously a lot more comfortable then. And then it went up to 200,000. I had, um, a period of about six months where through a partnership, a business partnership, I had one of those kind of moments um, or experiences that people show you in webinars. You know, when they show you in a webinar, all these sales in their emails, yeah. I had that for six months, all day, every day with a bunch of Russians buying courses from me. It was extraordinary, made a lot of money very quickly. Um, and then I had my 200,000 kind of floor sitting there and then I went and bought a farm with it a little bit later. So that sort of shifted that dynamic. So that's one thing was just gradually building. Um, and in amongst that story, there's always this I've had, um, you know, people always say, how can I get consistent income? It's like, well, you could get a job. And as long as you keep the job, you can be absolutely sure that you've got consistent income, but that's not always a very secure strategy these days because you're not sure if it'll still be there all the time. So I, I don't look for that kind of consistency. I look more for, I mean, it, the, you know, business is an alive thing and we have rhythms in everything. So I think we need to go with the rhythms of life. But the other story that happened, oh, you know, go on. No, please, please continue. <laughs> well, the, the, the other story that happened that started about six and a half years ago was that I met somebody very um, brilliant person and he started talking to me and he said look Sarah there are trillions of dollars in the world that are available for investing in ecological improvement investing in the environment and they're not being invested at the moment because there are no businesses that are built for the kind of scale and the kind of conditions that they're looking for and we talked and we, we talked about a whole lot of stuff and it turned into a business um, that was called love to in fact it's a group of businesses that are called love to which is all about people doing what they love to do and bringing their love to something that's important to them and this is important because i shifted from the middle class person who was teaching and coaching and you know doing a normal kind of coaching trajectory um, to somebody who was engaging in a business that is talking about and planning and building for billions of dollars of um uh, tr I want to say transactions. It's not all revenue to the business. There's revenue to the business, but it serves so many people. It's a, it's a different kind of model because it's, there's, there's a lot from my book in it. It's a, I think it's a very new kind of model, but I, I literally transformed from somebody who had been struggling to pay the rent and was just building this kind of small, nice coaching business to somebody who's in those kinds of conversations. And that's been um, six and a half years kind of building and launching. It's, we're still in early stages, really, because we're sort of rewriting some of the ways that you do business. That would never, ever have happened to me if I hadn't written the book. How do you remain open to go from 2,000 to 20,000 to 200,000 to love to and so on? I think there's, it's, it's uh, akin to a, 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 what is it called, a thermostat. Right. Like, you know, you kind of set your money thermostat. It's interesting that you said that, I, you know, I left I left a six a high six figure paying job. And I said this recently, a couple of years ago, you know, so that we could be more free. I mentioned we moved to the Dominican and so on. And it's been incredible. But I've noticed that my upper limit seems to be what I made at my W2 job, my my, my day job, we call it W2 in the US. It's so how did you how did you open up or turn up the temperature on that thermostat? to be open to 200,000 and the business billions in transactions and shifting from middle-class mindset to more of an infinite mindset. If I'm not putting words in your mouth, but if I'm hearing it right. Uh, yeah, that, it's actually a good description, I think, because in a way that's always where I need to go to. The honest truth is it usually comes through pretty severe contraction. I go through a phase where I either in the early days, there just really wasn't enough and I had to find a way to have more and it pushed my limits. It just pushed me to go somewhere that I wouldn't have gone to if I was comfortable. That in the very early days, it pushed me to see, well, what is this book about? Do I even believe in it? I used to battle with my mind and say, but what if it's not true? What if it's just an illusion? What if it doesn't work? That was kind of where I was. And then I would say, yeah, but I want it to be true. 
I really want life to be like this. I don't want life to be the sensible, boring thing that everybody says it is. I want it to be something better than that. And I, that, that was the turning point often because whenever I stepped into that, I want it to be like this, I always got a result. And so I realized that it's not just life is set in stone, here are the rules, be a good person and do the right thing and then you'll make money and be successful because that never worked for me anyway. I realized that there's a level at which we create the rules. And if I decide I want it to be like this, that takes me a step in that direction. I think in the, um, in the, um, in the kind of expanding capacity beyond perhaps what I would say my natural capacity would be, I usually end up in a, in a situation where either there's enormous need, you know, there are bills to be paid, and now it's not just my own bills, but there are other businesses involved and their bills need to be paid. And I'm sitting there looking at, well, you know, I, I know I can go and do a launch and make two or $300,000, but how do I do a million, multiple millions? How do I get up into the 10 millions? How do we actually go there? I don't know. But if either the pressure is hard enough, I'm, I will do anything. There comes a point where it's like, okay, then I really have to go spiritual because rationality will not give my brain the answers. It just doesn't have them. Rationality will tell you, well, you can do this, and you can do this, and it's too linear. But then I need to tap into something that's much bigger than me. I need to have that sense that life is unlimited, not limited. And I usually have to fight, you know, I go into feeling contraction, feeling pressure, thinking I can't do it. And then it's like, yeah, but I want to do it. I must do it. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to be somebody who's going to be beaten by this. This is what I've set my heart on. This is really important. Okay, how do I do it? And I start searching into the, the unknown. It's like I, right on the leading edge of my life, like looking out into everything that I don't know. And that's where I always find my answers. It's where I find my solutions. It's where the magic happens at times. It's where the flow exists, like this beautiful, when it happens, beautiful flow where people come into my life. I'm in conversations that I can hardly believe that I'm in. I had one this morning, just I'm sitting there thinking, how is it that me, you know, I'm just like, you know how it is. You don't feel much different from when you're a little boy or a little girl, me, little Sarah, you know, I'm just a little person you know, have my struggles in life and got some amazing things that I've done. How am I sitting in this conversation where somebody is helping my business to do something at such a scale that I don't really know how to imagine it, but those things happen and they happen really beautifully. And I know that that's because I've built this muscle over years, this kind of, is a bit gritty and it's a bit like, I, I, I have to, I must, I want to, I'm not going to be beaten. It's like the whole lot packaged together. And it, that's when I go into the, the unknown space. And that's where the beautiful things happen. Is it advisable? And this is a general question. Everybody has their own risk tolerance level or whatever to force contraction in order to get there. I'm thinking about the person that doesn't want their job, but uh, it pays well. I got a family. Yeah, I've got some runway um, but I want way more certainty before I take the leap or the person that owns the business and they know that the next thing they need is that, that rock star hire, but it's going to eat up a lot of what they have reserved in the short term. Ah, what if it doesn't work? So on and so forth. Is it advisable to force contraction, take that leap when you're on that edge like that? I personally don't advise it. I've met so many people, the really entrepreneurial kind who risk everything. The honest truth is what I've seen is it's an incredibly painful journey. It's incredibly bruising. There are some amazing wins at times, but I think that the losses cost too much. Um, but I think it's different for each person. So the first thing is if you have children, you have to be responsible. And I, like, I really don't recommend to people that they mess with their kids' lives just for the sake of proving that they've got the courage or they're brave enough to take a risk. Like, actually mm. really set yourself up. Find a, find a solution to set yourself up really well. There are good ways of doing it and not such good ways of doing it. I, I think that that's a fundamental responsibility. And I've seen people also who don't take care of their own needs in this entrepreneurial journey. 
They don't care, take care of their own money. And I've struggled with that because it's much easier to serve other people than it is to actually be responsible about my own money. And the honest truth is that that hurts other people. Even if you have a tolerance for it, it hurts all the people around you. So what I would do is rather than forcing contraction, if you want to do something, I would create a challenge for yourself. So it's more of a stretch than a squeeze. And if you can find a challenge that really makes your heart sing, life will start to conspire to work with you to make things happen. The problem in today's world is that we're not really used to a lot of singing hearts. We've become so, um, I think, so rational, so mentally focused that we're very cut off from our hearts a lot of the time. And we, we just don't get into that space. And it just, it doesn't work then. What I've, one of the most powerful things I've learned is that if I do everything with my mind, I will have to work hard. But if I do things in this more open way with more flow, I talk about working light. Working light is like a really big thing for me. Then I don't have to work hard. I can actually work light. But I have to do that in a different spirit in a way, in a different kind of flow from controlling everything with my mind. So if you can create a challenge for yourself that really it's like your heart, really your heart sings, you light up at the possibility of it. That's where the, the magic of life starts to kick in. If you can't, and many people can't do that, um, yeah, I personally don't recommend risking all um, unless you have an incredible tolerance for battle. If you, know, if you just want to be a warrior and you don't mind being injured half the time, uh, maybe that's okay. I just think there, there's, you know, there's better ways to do sport. There's better ways to fight. There's better ways to win in life than hurting yourself to get there. Makes sense. No, I appreciate that. Something you said a minute ago uh, brought me back to the book. You said when you need to pay your bills, when you need money to do this. And I thought this was a really, really interesting portion of the book where you talked about the language. So you need to be very clear with what you want from money, asking for money. But if you're using it in such a way that you're, you're, you're creating need, hey, I've got these bills I need to pay or this house I need to buy or this lifestyle change I need to make or whatever, the word need sort of becomes uh, a deliverable for this energy of money, meaning I need to pay bills. Well, if you, I need money to pay bills. Well, if you need money to pay bills, then money will provide the need for you to pay those yeah, bills. So the need for bills, it provides more bills. It's so annoying, but that's exactly well, what happens. Can you can you dive into that a little bit more? And this is again maybe skirting between the the energy, the I don't want to call it the spiritual aspect of money, but the energy or love for money versus maybe maybe practical real world examples uh, to kind of give a sense of it. Because I, I read that and a couple of other things in this book that it made so much sense because I've had those experiences. Uh, a big windfall of money that came in that I, I had said, if I had this, I would do that. And then I didn't do that. And somehow another need was created for that money. A furnace goes, an AC goes, right? Like a, a windfall of money that I decide not to leverage in the way that I said that I would and instead harbor it. And then something else comes up that just whoof, takes that money right out of my account. So that was, that was, <laughs> that was really, really grounding for me. Like, holy crap, that's happened to me. But can you get into that, that concept that money, when you need money or you have an energy of need for money, how it creates more need for you? Yeah, this is one of the most fascinating things um, because what I've observed in my own life and with the so many clients that I've worked with is that money is like our, our money and the actual things that happen to us around money are like a map of our inner world. And so if you say... An, well, and the other thing I want to say is like, it's, it's almost like this energy of money is literally able to listen to you and, and that it has to, it describes it in the book in a really cute way. It describes it like there's this great big bureaucracy in the sky and they're all kind of there to listen to your, everything that's going on inside you. And their job is to deliver all your wishes. So it's not just for cash and money, but it's actually all your wishes. It's kind of like a manifestation system, if you like. And it's, it's really beautiful in the book and very sort of naive and simple. But I've come to see that it, it really is rather like that. So if, for example, you are literally thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I can't pay my bills. I can't pay my bills. I can't pay my bills. What happens is you are manifesting, you're, you're sending out 
into that money bureaucracy, let's say, or sending out into the universe or putting out a message of not being able to pay your bills. And anyone who's been in that situation will know how, how difficult it is to get out of it because the more you struggle with money, the more you keep telling the story that I'm struggling with money. And it seems very counterintuitive to start to tell a story that's not struggling. But we do actually need to do that. That's what I've seen because that's where the mindset starts to change. But this happens at every level. You can be very, very wealthy and you'll still be experiencing exactly the patterns that are kind of inside you. And what I find is important to look at, it's important to look at what you're thinking. So what you're thinking, I think of it always as like it's a direct instruction to life about what I'm wanting. My thoughts are my instructions to life. But it's not just your thoughts, it's also your feelings. So you can say, and I see this often with people, they say, oh, I'd really, really like to have a house on the ocean or a new car of a certain kind or something, you know, maybe less um, material. But there's this heaviness and this emotion around it, you know, but but I'm not good enough for that. Or I'm that things like that never happen to me. So you've got the wish there, which is quite straightforward. But the emotion is actually, it's like saying, well, don't deliver this to this person because that person's belief is that they're not good enough for it. And it's literally like the energy of money has to deliver directly according to whatever it is that your instructions are. It's rather like ordering something from Amazon. You know, if you're if you're ordering a T-shirt and you don't put the size or you don't pay the money, you don't get the T-shirt. You've got to... Mm -hmm. You've got to tell what you want and you've got to do it. You've got to say what color you want. It's like if you don't put the color in, it's like the emotion piece isn't there. And then you don't get the T-shirt because they don't know which one to send you. So when you can be in a position where you, what you wish for lights you up, it's again, it's this heart opening moment, something that you would absolutely love to experience or love to have in your life. And you don't cloud it with heavy negative, dulling emotion, but you actually allow yourself to live in the, yeah, that's going to happen. Or even just to forget about it. Just forget about it. There's a wish out there, something you'd love, but just don't think about it and be happy and enjoy yourself and have a good life. That seems to create the conditions for things to happen more fluidly for you. And so you don't have to fight so hard and you don't have to work so hard. And you become one of those people who say, oh, this thing happened, it, it seemed like a coincidence, or it was some um, serendipity or synchronicity, whatever word you like to use. Those things tend to happen more when you have a lightness in your being and the things that you wish for are not what your parents told you you ought to want, but what you really would love with your heart, with an open heart. That is, is a really simple, simple thing. Yeah. Is there, are there any strategies to get into that state? Are there some grounding strategies, some things people can do on a daily basis, uh, uh, habits or routines or whatever to get into that state? And let me, let me qualify that question a little bit more. I think the cynic might say, okay, Hey, look, if I'm not in an optimal mood, money doesn't come. So, so anytime I get out of this sort of serendipitous state, money doesn't come, which takes the whole thesis of the law of attraction and everything else and just tosses it out the window. I'm back in my ra rational brain. It's all woo woo garbage, right? Yeah, but, yeah. but I think, I think in anybody would agree that you're right. When, when things seem to come into your life, you are in this state of flow. And it's funny, I'm having Stephen Kotler uh, tomorrow. I'm interviewing him. He's written six books, New York times bestsellers on flow, the science of flow. It's a real thing. It's scientific and it's spiritual, but that aside, the cynic might say that. So, all right, all right. You want me to be in this heightened state that allows for money to come in. But if I break that, if I break that energy, even just a little bit, it doesn't come in. And you can always point to that as why your strategy didn't work for me. So what are yeah, some I things know. people can do that can get into that state? Uh, the first thing I want to say is, look, you will get into that state. I get into that state. I still get into that state sometimes. It, that doesn't matter. What we tend to do is beat ourselves up for any negativity. And that's like double negativity now. And then you beat yourself up for that. And that's triple negativity. It doesn't work. So don't go down that road. It's like, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter doing it wrong. It doesn't matter messing it up. Because in the West, anyway, most of us are making money anyhow. Money's already coming. You're already good enough. But what you're wanting is something more. So it's really important not to get hung up on that. You can torture yourself 
into the ground with that kind of thing. And I know that very well. And I know many people who know it very well. So the lightness is also in relation to you. It's actually being lighter with yourself. It's forgiving yourself very easily. It's saying, okay, I messed up. All right, learning experience, move on, have another go. And being able to do that very easily, which is really good business advice anyway. Anyone who's been in business for a while will know that how you deal with failure is one of the most important things. But in terms of practices, I think um, there are a couple of things that make the most difference for me. One is actually, um, this might sound a bit weird in a, in a way, but my book, reading my book actually really changes something inside you because it's so surprising and it's so different. So you don't feel like, oh, that's just the same as so-and-so said. And that's, you know, it, it doesn't really feel like that. It actually has a direct effect on you. So it's a, it's a subtle education process about what money really is rather than what we've thought it is. And I can honestly say that it's more true than most of what we think. I'm not going to say this is the truth, the holy truth and the only truth, or whatever, who knows, but it's closer for sure. So actually learning about money um, in a new way is a really important part of it. Otherwise, you're trying to kind of change your old attitude using your old attitude. That's really difficult. The other thing is relaxation. I've practiced relaxation every day for 35 years. Um, all my clients always say, oh, I feel more relaxed about money because I make them relax every day. When you relax every day, you feel more relaxed about money. That's kind of obvious. And you know what? When you're more relaxed, you're not worried. You're not stressed. Everything gets easier and lighter. What is the, for relaxation specifically, what are you doing on a daily basis? What are you, I mean, there's so many different things. There's, there's salt floats, there's meditation, there's, there's massage, there's this, that, and the other. So as a daily practice, what, what are some of the things that you're doing? What are some of the things you've seen the most success with some of the clients you work with or people you work with, or just people you've talked to and they said, you know what? I mean, there's so many different things I know and it's individual, but just some, some tips on that. How do you, how do you get into a relaxed state daily? I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was trained for 22 years with Chinese masters. So I teach it, I teach it and I practice it. Um, how do you do it? Well, one of the things that's really important to understand about relaxing is that it's not trying. Okay, so it's a kind of doing nothing. Mm. It's a kind of letting go. Um, I'll often start by, I just go through my body. If I'm relaxing on my own, it's like I'm speaking. Actually, I think I'm speaking to energy. That's my language, you know, or I think I'm talking to the universe. It doesn't really matter how you think, but I don't think I'm talking to myself. And I'm giving instructions. So I'm saying, please relax my, I, I always start with my lower belly, because if you've trained with Chinese masters, everything starts with the lower belly. That's their center of energy. So I say, please relax my lower belly. And I say, please relax my hips. Please relax my legs, relax my knees. I just go through like that. And within two or three minutes, and I'm pretty sure that anyone who does this will find the same thing. My body starts to relax, literally. It's as simple as that. I can lead somebody for two or three minutes or five minutes and they feel completely different after that. I'm just giving instructions to life. It's like I'm asking life to relax me. That's how I think of it. And funnily enough, when you ask life to do something, it does it. It's a really amazing thing. So what I do then, because I've trained so much, I start to think about, you know, I start to allow myself to open up. I open up my mind really important so it's not kind of control freaking all the time i open up my heart so that i feel more love for life more enthusiasm i open up sometimes i open up my soul because that's meaningful for me um, and then i allow myself to experience the flow of energy through me so i become receptive and i know that i'm receiving energy Energy is the life force. It's the qi in the Chinese system, in qigong and um, all those other kinds of things. It's what acupuncture works with. And qi or energy is something that flows through us that you can feel. It's not an imaginary thing. Once you get it, you can actually feel it. You can feel flow. You can feel tingling in you. You can feel a sense of inner peace. There are different ways of experiencing it, but it is an absolutely tangible experience.
And when you start to feel that energy flow, your whole system relaxes. So you start by relaxing and because you relax, you open up, you receive more energy that relax you more, relaxes you more. And then that opens you a little more, you receive more energy and it relaxes you more. And you, you, you gradually become, we, we say empty, your mind just sort of, it's like, oh, just kind of here, not, not busy, not occupied. Now, when things that when you're working really hard, it's not easy to do this, but it's all the more important. And that's why I do it more or less every day as a practice, as a, as a practice, because when your mind is empty and your body's relaxed and your system, your whole energy is relaxed, then what happens is you receive, you, you receive what we, we say, fresh life energy. That's actually, um, it's kind of like the coding of life. It's the coding. It's the instructions for things to happen to you. It's what makes good things happen to you. And when you're tense, you're all tight, you're really contracted, you don't get much of that fresh energy. You just don't. It's just, you know, because everything's tense and tight, it can't flow. So when you're relaxed and expanded, it flows through you. When you're tight, it can't flow. And so you don't get much of it. And so you feel like, oh, I'm trying to live and I don't have enough energy to live. And then you work really hard, you get even more tense. And it's a sort of vicious cycle. It's like, oh, I don't have enough energy. And then you start to get into that, you know, you start to not to be able to balance your energy, not to manage it. You, you head on the burnout path. But the opposite path to burning out is to learn how to open up, relax, receive, be nourished by this beautiful, fresh energy, fresh life energy. And what happens is you find your life gets easier. It's, it, things happen more easily. It's more enjoyable. It's more pleasant. It's more what you want and less of what you don't want. So relaxation is, to me, more fundamental than meditation, more fundamental than any kind of pumping yourself up. Because when you pump yourself up, I know it's a really common thing to do. It creates this tremendous pressure and excitement. And you can do it for a certain period of time, but it creates a lot of force. And, and the, the natural world, the real life, doesn't really work with force. So it tends to create a counter force against you and then you have to struggle when you can relax you get into the flow of life and then things happen in a more alive and a more natural way and look this is crazy making stuff for the mind because the mind says i can't possibly relax i've got things to do and and pe people say to me what am i supposed to do now sarah thank you very much nice lecture i understand everything what am i supposed to do now i said do nothing no i can't do nothing i've got things to do it's like, but actually try it. No, I can't. Just try it. Let's do it together. And it's like, oh, wow, I feel so good. Oh, everything's so easy. <laughs> it's kind of just, it's really, really simple stuff. There's a great movie. I don't know if you've seen it. I think it's, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the, name of the movie, but it was Jason Sudeikis and uh, Paul Rudd where he's trying to teach, uh, Paul Rudd's trying to teach, it's a comedy, trying to teach uh, uh, Jason today because I think is his name, how to surf. And he's like, yeah, do less. Like, do do less. And the guy's literally just laying on the board. He's like, no, do 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 even less than that. Like, do do nothing. That's what kind of it made me think of, right? The guy's like, I'm it doing nothing. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, we don't do nothing all day, but right. 20 right. minutes or half an hour of doing nothing is incredible food for all the things you need to do later. I love that. The, uh, the, the, your first recommendation on the book I shared with you when I got recommended the book, I thought, okay, uh, yeah, good title, interesting. And then I just, you know what, let me get it. A month, two months went by and I, I was sort of looking for a new book. I was in an airport in Austin coming back from an event and uh, I started listening and it was so unique in that it was, it was, okay, this is written by money. It was written, you know, essentially you speaking on behalf of money to you, which you put out into the world. Uh, so I, honestly, I think it's a great, whatever it is, $20 buy on, on Amazon or one credit on Audible to, to grab the book um, because it does really help you realign. One of, the one of the concepts you talk about, actually, let's do this. Let's make this really practical for me, if you will. I will use me as a subject here. So assuming that I'm able to embed the practice that you just mentioned, you know, some sort of relaxation and I get into a flow state and everything else. And talking about you know the the language in which you re make requests for money, <clears throat> excuse me, getting in alignment, you know, having love for money, so on and so forth. So I've gone through this exercise. I've written a letter, 
I've done all these things. I moved down here to the Dominican Republic. We love it here. We'll move back at some point, but we would love to buy a home here. And one of the things that's a challenge is financing. It's very expensive to finance here. Interest rates are 10, 12, 15%. Uh, the terms aren't desirable. Hey, stop, 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 stop. You're already. <laughs> Hit me. It's, it's already getting really hard, okay? <laughs> okay. I'm just going to play that back to you a little bit. You said, we would love to buy a home here. There you go. Yes. That's it. That's it. That's where your heart sings. That's where you light up, maybe all your family. That's actually really the instruction. All the rest, oh, it's incredibly expensive. It's incredibly difficult. It's like, okay, make it real. You're literally giving the instruction to life, make it incredibly expensive, make it incredibly difficult, make wow. it almost impossible for us to do it, please. You know, I'm giving you these instructions. Yeah, I'd really love it. And what have you got now? It's like, oh, please, please, but big but. That's great. So yeah, it go is, ahead. There's, some, there's something, and I wish I could, you know, just explain it all scientifically, but I can't. There is just something that happens when you say, I would love to buy a house here, and it makes you smile. Just makes you, uh, you really would love it. That is the condition under which you can, you can somehow sometimes either break all those laws of really expensive, really difficult, all of that. It's something, something works through that. It's sort of like cuts through them. Or you find a way that you can still do what you want with all of those rules in place, which means you probably have to make a whole lot more money or, you know, something happens. But that, that's really where it sits. That's what I found. I love that. Great point. I do. It's, you go from what you want and being in that to the how. How, yeah. how about this? How do I do this? How do I do that? And it does, you could feel the freneticness in my energy just now. I could feel it. When you stopped me, it, it stopped this frantic sort of pace I was going into on, on, uh, on the conditions by which it's too difficult. So that's a great, great point. Thank you for that. Yeah. And what's important to understand is how you feel in that frantic, frenetic, oh my God, so much pressure. I, I really want this and I've got to do it. And I've said to my family, we're going to get a house here. And so you feel even more pressure, maybe all of that, yeah. that energy, that feeling is what you are literally in the present moment manifesting for your future. So you're manifesting more of that pressure feeling. So if we can be in a state of pleasure, enjoyment, lightness, lightheartedness, just really simple, not, not, again, not pumped up, but just like simple, natural human joyfulness or enjoyment. That's, um, that's what you start to manifest for your future. So how we feel now is incredibly important. People don't realize this. They, they really think it doesn't matter how I feel now, as long as I'm you know, going to achieve something, everything will be fine later. It doesn't work like that. How you feel now is the most important thing, even if you have nothing, even if you're really in a difficult situation, if you can create some peace around it, if you can find something good, if you can find a little pleasure or enjoyment, it goes a long way to healing it. And I've helped people solve big legal problems just by dealing with how they feel now. And instead of freaking out and getting really worried and stressed out, make peace, just be at peace with it step by step. Every challenge, every new thing that turns up, okay, let's just make some peace. Let's relax. Let's relax. And then it's the results are remarkable. So how we feel now is really important. And I personally think we've been sold a really big lie um, around that kind of delayed gratification, which is all about suffering. There's nothing wrong with building big things. And, you know, the results come later. But if you do it with suffering, you're building a life where you're going to just have more and more of that. That's a great point. I love that. I've, I've struggled with the concept of delayed gratification versus instant gratification, you know, and it's sort of like, well, I want to live now. But of course, delayed gratification is often championed as the, uh, the ultimate trait to have if you want to build wealth or have something for the, for your legacy, for your children, so on and so forth. But I like that point. Like it's got to feel delayed gratification has to feel purposeful, light, uh, uh, you know, aligned, if you will. 
correct? Because then, you, well, yeah, the other beautiful thing about that is then you feel fulfillment in the moment, even though I don't have it yet. So there's this big thing you're building, let's say it's, let's say it's intergenerational wealth, you want to protect your children, you don't have that yet. But you're feeling fulfillment now because you, you, you feel good right now. Not only does that help you to build it, if, if only from a rational point of view, because you're in a better state of mind, you're not worried all the time, you're not stressed. We know that stress gets in the way of performance, feeling good is good for performance. But then you get this added thing is that instead of creating this legacy for your children where your whole life was filled with stress, you create a legacy of you've got the wealth and they've had, a, you know, you've had a beautiful time together. I think that that's a better way of living. It's, it's actually, as you talk through that and I'm thinking through it, when I, when I do think about what has manifested in my life up to this point, it does come from a standpoint of sort of a stated vision without how and practicality applied it's a stated vision and then yeah just sort of the next thing happens and the next thing happens and suddenly you're there if i'm applying yeah. the principles of the book in this regard i think that's a great great point i'm so glad i have that's why i love talking to authors i read the book and i think i get it and then the author can kind of like direct me so thank you for that but if i want to apply the or and not but and if i want to apply further principles if i want to learn from what you've what you've uh, uh taught in this book and what you teach in your practice so, okay, I, I align with I would love to own a house here. Leave it there. But at a certain point, and maybe I'm being way too specific, I got the impression, or at least I read in the book, you, you know, ask for what you want. If it's 600 grand to buy a house, ask for 600 grand and stay, stay aligned with that. Don't, don't send different messages. Don't send mixed messages. Just ask for 600 grand. How do I do that while maintaining sort of a, a, a relaxed <laughs> A relaxed posture, <laughs> the idea that I would love to own a house. Like, at what point is it okay for me to, or is there not, or am I thinking of this wrong? Like, help, help guide me. And I know a lot of people listening will be on that. Like, okay, relax, manifest, feel good about what the future state is. Makes sense. But then, where and how do I ask for it? What's the? What do I do then? What do I do next? It's actually a really interesting question because at one level, when you said, "I'd really love to buy a house here." In many ways, you, you put that request out at the same time. Mm. Can you see? It's like you buying a house includes, well, it might be 600 grand. It might be 550. It might be that somebody gives it to you. Who knows? Like there's all kinds of possibilities. Sure. Um, so there's a, there's a really tricky art because, you know, whether it's buying a house or in business where I, where I find, you know, the, we can't ignore our responsibilities. So if this, there may be something that really has to happen, it might, in your case, you, if you don't buy a house in the end, you'll go back and you just don't have a house and it's a di you're disappointed. But in some situations like, well, we've actually got to pay the bills for the business. We've got to, whatever it is. So we actually have to get results. And that's where I think the real learning ground is for everybody. And I would say that that's a very kind of crunchy place. Um, each time I, I need to expand my capacity, that's where the challenges come. It's like, how do I actually do this. So um, I think that each person needs to find their own signature, if you like, it's like your own, the quality of your relationship, like no two people have the same sense and signature of the relationship with their partner. It's rather like that with money. It's, it's unique. But for me, um, there are a few things to watch out for. So you could really easily do and what, what I would probably do is say, you know, please, bring me 600,000. But what tends to happen is then, you know, you get 20 grand, let's say, or 50 grand somewhere, but you keep asking for 600,000. This is people do all the time. They never actually count that they've got some of it. And that's very confusing for the system of money. And it tends to leave you in a place. I've seen people literally, I had somebody recently, I think, and she said, oh yeah, I really want to buy a house, but I don't have the deposit yet. And I said, well, do you have some of the deposit? And she said, yeah, I've got about half of it. Her language is all the time, I don't have the deposit. I don't have the deposit. She has half the deposit already. Can you feel the difference? Yeah, I it's, can. It's literally, I mean, it's such a small thing, but it, when you start to get a bit more advanced, it's these small things that really make a difference. That's what I notice. And, and we do have to be more precise um, and we need to be more precise. Like I have to be very, very light to ask for anything. I remember once, this was quite a few years ago, I was running a retreat about money 
And for, I think I just moved into a new house that was rather expensive um, rent. And I realized the first weekend that I was actually short of money to pay the rent. I couldn't believe it. And I was in this retreat and I thought, help, I've got to do something. I didn't have any time to do anything because I had people there. And I just sat in the retreat and I said, please pay this for me. And half an hour later, I had somebody paid for something, double what they were supposed to pay intentionally. They knew it was double. Mm. Problem was solved. So I have found a way, but I can't, you know, somebody said to me the other day is, no, said to one, somebody who bought my book, well, is she a billionaire? No, I'm not a billionaire. Okay. I haven't found the way to be that good at it. I'm learning. Um, I'm learning how to do it too. And I think we each have our own challenges and our own blockages and background stories and all of that. So I don't judge myself or anybody for where we are. I just know that life always brings me my next step and I need to face it. But I need, what I do is I just very, very lightly, almost like casually, I just say, oh, please sort this out for me or please pay this bill. I don't say, please give me the money. It doesn't work for me. I say, please pay it. Please buy that house. Um, if it's something very big, it's not always easy to connect with it. It's just like, nah, I can't possibly believe that. Now you can, there can be a certain kind of naivety where it does actually work. Some people can do that. Most of us are too clever and too, too mental to be able to do that. So then you could set up a system where you're constantly putting money somewhere. Like, you know, you're, you're going to put 20,000 a month into your house thing or whatever. And that might be more than you're used to putting aside, but that becomes more manageable. It's like, okay, an extra 20,000, I, I can do that. So you have to pace it. It's really important, I found, to grow your confidence by just little stretches. Very big stretches tend to leave us a kind of missing something for too long. And then we live in the, oh, I haven't got there yet. I haven't got there yet. I haven't got there yet. So always counting your wins, always appreciating every little bit that comes in. Always um, just little stretches, it's like oh, little tests. And so you learn your own language with money. And sometimes, quite frankly, it seems like life has another plan. And I do it all right. I do everything that I've learned to do. And it doesn't work. And I think, well, this is really unfair. You know, da, 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 all those thoughts come in. But once I get through whatever that particular situation is, contraction, I realize, oh my goodness, there was something much bigger that I gained from that situation, far more important. So I, I, I notice that I'm always sort of being stretched as well. Um, that might be partly to do with my own nature. Maybe I like that. Um, but every time I get a certain capability, it feels like it's put to really good use and then I need, it's like, okay, no, it's not time for something else. Yeah. There's so. a saying, um, your life is determined by the quality. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your questions. I love that yeah. saying. Cause I think yeah, about when, when you're, when you're talking about it, you're, you're trying to tune into, this is what I heard. You're trying to tune into the best practical way for you to ask the question that delivers what you want delivered. I love what you said, because I told you in the beginning, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to play the cynic a couple of times. And one of the things I was going to ask is, why aren't you the richest woman in the world? Um, and I think you answered that really well. Like there's there's people that teach how to create courses, online courses, and they do well with that. But they're not the most successful online course creator in the world, but they've had success in that regard. And I think that's a really fair way of putting it. But the quality of questions applies in so many ways as parents. Like there's many different ways, you know, that we try to have conversations with our kids and trying to find the right way of asking the question as opposed to stating the thing, you know, to get them to think about or whatever. And I think it's sort of the same thing here. Uh, you even ask yourself questions. Robert Kiyosaki famously said, I don't say I can't afford it. I ask, how can I afford it? And that allows me to, you know, start to think and open my mind to the possibilities. And I hear that with what you're saying. So I think that's exactly. really important. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. It, exactly. Yeah. To me, it's questions and requests. You can request directly and you can ask questions. And good questions produce good answers, good requests produce good solutions. One of the things that you've done in this interview for me um, that you know I self-imposed on myself in the book that you've relieved is that it has to be perfect. Like if I falter, if I waver, if I say the wrong, if I said, 
I need, you know, not I need, but like bring me $816 and tomorrow I say 815, ah, connection broken, gone. You're unable to manifest money for the rest of your life. You know, like that was the thing. Like, oh my God, it feels like such pressure to make this request. But I love what you said. It's it's like with my kids, right? Like I, I might ask a question a certain way and it might be a great question, but it didn't land for them. So I have to figure out another way to ask that question for the for the interaction to open up. And that's what you're, that's what you're talking that about. Is, that's what you're essentially that, practicing. That's such a good description because to me, you know, money is an aspect of life and kids, they're part of life. You just cannot make kids do the thing in the way that you think they should because they're human beings, they're alive and they're a com complete entity in their own right. And money is kind of like that. And so if we can treat it as something that's alive and constantly moving, and really an aspect of life, then we approach it with the right attitude, which is curiosity and openness and receptivity. Rather than seeing it as something that can be used to control, sometimes even to dominate and to kind of deal with fear, where once we get into that fear cycle, everything starts to go downhill. So it's this aliveness, that's what it brought out for me, like learning about money in this way brought out a kind of aliveness in my life and a much more engaged way of living life. Um, and it's in a way I can say it's much more challenging, but it's, it feels like that's what I came here for. It's the challenge that I actually am alive for rather than the challenges that life chucks at you, you know, that just can make it feel very difficult. So it is part of that kind of growing yourself like really being willing always to go into new territory always being willing to to say well how can i do this differently how do i not be stuck here just like with the robert kiyosaki question to be able to do that over and over and over and over again that changes the essence of of you from the inside and that changes the quality of your life and then we start to talk about i think real wealth which is about far more than just money Hmm. Before the exercise that you did in your book that inspired me to do that same exercise of writing a letter to money, whenever I felt heavy about money, the, the best tactic I knew to feel good about money was to give it away, pay for somebody behind me at Starbucks, donate money. It, always, it never, ever feels bad to give money away. It's just money always feels good when I'm giving it away. In the book, you talk about this. You talk about uh, the idea of contribution and giving and so on. Can you just go over the, the idea of a vibrational bank account? What is that? How do you leverage that? Oh, that's a very uh, kind of rational question about a very <laughs> kind of very big idea. I told you, I was going to toe the line between rational and the woo on this. So I'm trying to, yeah, 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 yeah. Trying to stick <laughs> the nice landing. One. It's a nice, <laughs> nice attempt. So, so um, a vibrational bank account, this is right towards the end of the book. And I got this idea to start asking money. It's the only time I asked a question. I said, what is the new currency? I don't know why I asked it. It makes more sense to me now. But I, so I wrote some additional chapters. And this vibrational bank account is what came through. And it was kind of like a way of understanding, I think, the inner workings of manifestation, really. So you're, if you think about bank accounts, you can have a bank account that's in credit. And you can also have another bank account that's in debit at the same time. And they don't actually cancel each other out. You can keep putting money into the one that's in credit and it doesn't get sucked up by the one that's in debit. So I think it's a little bit like that, that this vibrational bank account, if you do good things, if you feel good, if you're... Um, well, most of the things that we sort of know as human beings are good, you're kind of adding credit to your vibrational bank account. And if you do things that are harmful, I, I think the way we can put it really is to say, if it's harmful to life, so harmful to other humans, harmful to animals, harmful to plants, if we're harmful to life, then you, you, you still start to build up this debt. If you're it talks about life positive. It's really hard to find a good word for it. Like if the actions you do and the thoughts you have are supportive to life, then you build credit. This is all inner state stuff. The thing that's important about this is that that credit account is like a drawdown account for the results that you want in your life. So whether you want to, you know, you want a new girlfriend, you want the house in the Dominican Republic, you want, it can be anything. 
you want some amazing experience, if you like, that's kind of like your manifestation list, your wish list. And that credit is, is the drawdown that can be turned into cash, if it's cash that you need, but it can also be turned into houses and children and all the good things in life that we want. Um, and look, we have to be really careful, again, not to get into beat up territory around this. Not it, This is a very flexible, very expansive idea. It's not something to, it's like, oh my goodness, now I'm in debit, oh help, I'm gonna destroy myself. That's a really bad place to go. But we all do things that are harmful to life. And so, you know, we all have some debit balance, but we don't want it to go too low. If it actually goes too low, um, life becomes unsustainable. That means you die, basically. And, you know, yeah, we, yeah. yeah really. Um, that doesn't mean you get killed in a horrible car accident. It's more likely, you know, you get chronically ill and you know you have a heart attack or whatever. It's just if your life is consistently... Um, and look, many people don't know that what they're doing is harmful to life. They eat food and they have behaviours and they buy things. You know, as consumers, we're all harming things a lot. But we just have, we have to live with a certain amount of debt and a certain amount of credit. But it gives a kind of direction like, oh, well, if I build my credit, it's, an, it's a motivation to generally be a good person, not like a boring good person, but actually genuinely enjoy your life, feel fulfillment, experience joy, more freedom. These are the kinds of inner behaviors that, that create more credit. So the things that we long for as human beings, inner peace, joy, love, beautiful families, relationships, all of these things, these all build your credit. What's useful is that from time to time you have an emergency, like you really need some money quickly now, or you're in hospital, you've had an accident or something, you need some healing now. It helps sometimes to understand why some people get that, and for other people it's a real struggle. Um, I've worked a lot around this for many years because I, I was trained in healing, and I've seen the people who got healing and the people who didn't. You, know, you always ask the question, why did that person not make it? Why did that person... Why, why did it work for them? And look, I can't sit here and say 100% I know this to be the case. I would say I'm always in the testing of these things. But there's something in this vibrational bank account that is a very kind of light, understandable way that helps us to orientate towards beauty, goodness, joy, good things in life, and orientate away from behaviors that are actually harmful to yourself and ultimately harmful to others. I love that. I love that. You're an entrepreneur, love to be bright green. Talk to me a little bit about what that is, what this project is for you, what it means to the world, what you're trying to do with it. Just let's hear about it. So love to be bright green started from this conversation I mentioned earlier um, with my now business partner. Um, around all this money that's washing around in the world, supposed to be invested in, in the environment, in ecological improvement, which we know is desperately needed. We have so many parts of the world that are becoming desert or where the condition of the land is deteriorating really rapidly, including in the most advanced countries in the world. Um, so we desperately need it and we needed to address the problem. And so we basically set about how do we solve this problem at scale? And so we built a business that um, on the one hand empowers regenerative farmers. So farmers who actually farm in a way that improves the ecological condition of the land. So it empowers them. There are many of them in the world already. They're doing a fantastic job. They do it pretty much for free. They don't get paid to do it. Their activity is one of the most important activities on the planet today and yet it is not valued in our current economy. It is more valuable to cut down a tree and turn it into lumber than it is to leave the tree living because that's the way our economy is. So we said, that's not right. We need to be able to value a living world. Um, and so we created a system for evaluating the work of farmers and land managers to, who improve the ecological condition of the land that they manage and putting a value on that and then turning that into an, an ecological asset in the form of a token, a, a digital token. And, and then the other piece of the puzzle is to bring that money into the system. So those tokens go to the farmers, they can sell the tokens, they then, and these are called bright greens. 
So the bright, the har what we're really saying is a farmer produces a harvest of bright greens every year, which is ecological improvement. And then the, the, the idea is to sell it in the financial markets. Um, so to sell it all the way from the individuals like you and me who care about the environment, who care about the future for children, for example, for the next generations, all the way to the big institutions. Um, it really needs to go right the way through the economic system that as a world, we support life, living systems. Now you begin to see how it ties in with the vibrational bank account. This yeah. is a business that is built on the principle of not harming life and supporting life across the planet at scale in collaboration with the very institutions often that are making the harmful decisions. It's like, how do we help the system make better decisions? Mm. Um, and do that in a business way that supports farmers um, to do more of what they do, to teach it to others, and to grow this movement of regeneration and protection of nature. That's amazing. What um, what stage is this business in? What phase? Um, we uh, recently we we basically did a soft launch of the Bright Greens, so we soft launched it to my clients from my teaching business. Um, we're now actually now building a, um, a go-to-market strategy, you know, for a proper commercial launch, and at the same time looking at how we can um, build the institutional and the large-scale size. So we're we're doing the kind of small piece and then the big piece at the same time. Um, so we're in the very early stage in terms of actually selling a product, but we are selling a product, which is amazing. And um, yeah, we, we're. Um, yeah, we're building. This. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. such a journey. It's just such, it, it's such a journey to do something like this. It's like I almost don't have words for it. Yeah, we're well, building it's big. this new thing. It's it's big. It's big, right? So it's it's, a, it's, a, it's green. Very simple. It's big and it's bright green. And it's, beautiful. it's big and it's bright green. So it's love to dot group, I believe, in order for people to go check out what you're doing there. Is that accurate? Love to dot group is the website, and bright green. The, actually, the bright greens. These actual things they're on yep. brightgreens.io brightgreens with an s.io and that's where you can actually find out all about the bright greens and there's a white paper there and all this kind of stuff you'd expect there's some guys in a uh a, a men's mastermind group i belong to actually this podcast is the marketing front of it uh that are in the ag space so i'll i'll be messaging them with uh with the websites and everything so you know uh, hopefully we can Thank you. garner up some support of course of course Sarah, I would love to go another three, four hours with you, but I, we, we're, we'll cut it here. What, uh, what's the best way for people to learn more about you, what you do, uh, find the book, all of that stuff? Is there a central place to go? Yeah, sarahmccrum.com. And that's S-A-R-A-H-M-C-C-R-U-M.com, correct? Yeah, yeah Beautiful. correct. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.